I don't really have to position much because I'm going to the seller that already needs it. And so I'm going to sellers that have expired listings. They've already tried to sell the house on the market. So think about this. They've gone through six months of being told no or being lowballed. I don't really have to position myself. I just say, hey, looks like you're trying to get a number um, that's probably a little bit hard to get to. I can get to that number if you're willing to let me take over the payments. It's really, they're like, wait, hold on. The number one thing we hear, okay, this is written on the wall in our office. The sellers say, wait, you can do that? <laughs> that's so what I'm thinking right now. All the time. The sellers are like, wait, you can do that? And it's because we position our acquisition strategy to the people that absolutely need it. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Report Saturday edition. And I got my co-host today. I got my man, Pace Morby. Pace, welcome to the show. Dang, I get to be a co-host today? You are the co-host on the Saturday edition, my man. So uh, for today's topic, rapid fire, I want to talk everything subject to creative finance, but let's jump into it. What is subject to? Subject to is a way to buy anything, whether it's a house, a car, a plane, a train, a business, a hotel, whatever it is. It's a way to acquire. Subject to is a, an acquisition strategy. It's a way to acquire something by just simply taking over somebody's existing payments. The story I tell with everybody all the time is like, could I take over your payments on your phone that you have to Verizon? Yes. Okay. Well, why couldn't I do that with a house or a business? So subject to is an acquisition strategy to take over something by just making the payments on that existing something, whatever that is. What type of seller makes a good candidate for subject to? Somebody with low equity, typically on subject to, somebody that's going through something painful somebody that tried to get a number on the market that couldn't get the number and expired listings. If you want to, if you want to deal today, you want to deal today right now, subject to deal expired listings. How many expired listings pop up in the country every day? 15,000 wow. a day. This is just on the MLS. Yeah. Well, they come off the MLS. They go to prop stream or they go to Crexy or they mm. go to land watch. They go to a thousand different places, but they, we have 15,000 new ones every day. So think about this week. We're looking at 80,000 expired listings this week. Tell me there's not 20,000 sub two deals in that, that bundle right there. What is your best or favorite way to position a subject to offer? I don't really have to position much because I'm going to the seller that already needs it. And so I'm going to sellers that have expired listings. They've already tried to sell the house on the market. So think about this. They've gone through six months of being told no or being lowballed. I don't really have to position myself. I just say, hey, looks like you're trying to get a number um, that's probably a little bit hard to get to. I can get to that number if you're willing to let me take over the payments. It's really, they're like, wait, hold on. The number one thing we hear, okay, this is written on the wall in our office. The sellers say, wait, you can do that? <laughs> that's so what I'm thinking right now. All the time. The sellers are like, wait, you can do that? And it's because we position our acquisition strategy to the people that absolutely need it. Mm, I love that. So that's one of your, your biggest objections. Mm -hmm. uh, what's another objection that you guys get? Um, objection is what happens if you don't make the payments? If I don't make the payments, think about this. Somebody in foreclosure, right? A lot of sub two deals come out of foreclosure. If somebody's in foreclosure and I catch up their payments and take over, take over the existing payments, do they really care if I stop making payments? They were already in foreclosure. Yeah. So let's take those people out of the, out of the category. If I fail to make the payments, if I bought that property from you subject to, that means I probably give you a little bit of money, $5,000, $7,000 up front so you can have moving expenses, whatever. I've probably made some payments along the way. I might even have a cash flowing um, seller in there or a tenant in there. The first question I ask the sellers, under what situation would I not make your payments? And they go, oh, I don't know. I go, I know, but it's your question. So you tell me what cir circumstance am I not making your payments? And they go, well, if the property is not making money, I go, so let's make sure as we structure this deal, this is a deal that makes money for me. It's actually the way I get a better deal is taking that question and re-identifying it as a fear of my own. I'm like, you're right, you have a valid fear. I might not make the payments, but if I'm making cat monthly cash flow, why would I ever miss the payment? And they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I go, the way we have it structured right now, I barely make anything. So if that's really a valid concern of yours, let's make sure we change the structure so I make a little bit more money. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two is I tell them, um, if I default on the payments, you take the house back and you keep the payments. You keep the down payment I give you. You take all that. Well, wouldn't the bank technically take it back if you defaulted and went into foreclosure? If I defaulted and for, went into foreclosure, I've never seen that happen with anybody I know in sub two. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you can't handle a sub two deal, man, I don't know. I, I just, <laughs> I've never seen this happen. Yeah. Like, why would you take on a property that you would plan on defaulting on? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, that makes sense. I'm curious. So out of all the properties you're buying, mm -hmm. you mentioned you got a thousand units under uh, contract since the first of the year. Um, what percentage of those are via sub two and which percentage are, are via seller financing? 
Um, the larger the asset, the more seller finance gets incorporated. So I'd say 60% of the deals I have have some sub two involved in the multifamily space. And then with a 40% component on seller finance. So for example, the RV park that I just bought, $5 million purchase price. He has an SBA loan on the park of like $2.5 million. So I take I take the SBA, the SBA loan over to at $2.5 million subject to the other equity seller finance. So it's a, we call it a hybrid. So it's a hybrid deal. The larger the asset, the larger the asset, the more hybrid structures end up coming into play. In single family, it's like 80% sub to 20% seller finance. Yep. In multifamily, it's like 60, 40. And when you get into big multifamily, it's almost entirely seller finance. Yeah. So in terms of the sellers that make a good candidate to provide seller financing, a lot of them are mom and pop, the ones that are not going to be rolling their proceeds into another asset, but instead they're going to retire yeah. and they prefer the cash flow ongoing and uh, they prefer to reduce their tax burden. What is your favorite way to pitch or propose seller financing to a seller? Oh. So good. Um, so we call these sellers, we go through a filter and the filter is 15 years of ownership or longer. And we say, Hey, my name is Pace. And if I could show you how to retire with more money than your financial advisor showed you, would you be open to selling your property to me? Mm. So we position them. We go, what we're going to do is we're going to upgrade you from the landlord to the lender. Mm. What's the highest, the highest calling in all of real estate is always the lender. And right now you're the lowest calling in all of real estate, which is the landlord. Everybody hates you. If you're in California, everybody into everybody hates landlords. They got some crazy tightening uh, landlord tenant laws. That's pretty crazy. There you go. So there, there's the thing is why not get out of that position? Let me take that position over and you go at, to the highest calling in all of the land. I told this story about a totem pole one time where, you know, a totem pole, right? Native Americans. Yep. What's the animal at the very top? What is it? It's the eagle. Mm. What's also the number one logo for every bank in the country? Eagle. The eagle. Why is that? It's because it's the highest calling in all of the land. Gotcha. It's because they can see everything. They have domain and control over everything. Eagle eyes. Right. They have eagle eyes. So I said, right now, unfortunately, you're not even on the totem pole, Mr. Landlord. You're so buried in the ground. You're the thing holding everybody else together. The contractors, the tenants, the this, they're all on the totem pole. We can see them, but you're the foundation of the whole thing. You're buried. You got dirt in your face. Nobody cares about you. So let us upgrade you from the landlord to the lender and you can be the eagle. And they're like, oh my gosh, I love that. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. And I go, the other thing is they have, uh, you know this, um, they have a massive responsibility with tenants, taxes, trash, all the stuff. And guess who doesn't have to worry about that? The lender. So we just tell them we're, we, we're, we would like to help you exit where your financial advisor could never tell you or help you understand. Most financial advisors don't understand capital gains. They don't understand seller finance and how it can actually help them out. So what I do is I bring my CPA involved. My CPA talks to their CPA if they have one. Most of the time they don't. They have a bookkeeper. So your CPA will talk directly with the seller in yeah, that my case? CPA, my CPA is full time on my staff. I love that. And you just put him on a call with the seller? Yep. He'll do a Zoom presentation. He'll get, pull up IRS laws. He'll pull up all this stuff. Dude, I love that. Yeah, it's gangster. I used to pay a, an IRS, or not an IRS guy, but I used to pay a CPA to do this for me. I'd pay him 200 bucks an hour to overcome some of these objections before I got good at it. Now I overcome big objections and I don't need him, but now I have a full-time CPA. He's also a tax attorney, which is great. And what will end up happening is when it's big assets and we need to do a massive capital gain remediation or mitigation, he'll come in and structure these things and he'll go, this is what you, we should do. You could wipe out all your taxes for the next 10 years if we do it this way. Go and consult with your own CPA to verify. The other CPA is like, this is not possible. So that's where he ends up getting on another Zoom and goes, show me that it's not possible. And it's very similar to agents. They say that's not possible. Sub two is not possible. Seller finance. I mean, you know how many agents say wholesale is not possible? It's Probably a lot. A lot, dude. Yeah. Title companies say it's not possible. Mm -hmm. Still today in 2024, people are still, still saying this crap. So he gets on and he'll go, well, let me show you the IRS code. Let me show you this. Let me show you case law. Blah, 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 blah. And it overcomes the seller's objections and we buy big assets. 256 unit deal in Springfield, Illinois. That was the first time I ever had to do it. And the seller told his, it told the CPA on the zoom. He's like, I'm going to fire your ass. How do you not know this? <laughs> and he's this, his CPA's answer was like, I've just never been interfaced with it. So of course I don't know it. Wow. So seller talks to your CPA. Um, and we know with seller financing, um, you know, you want to be able to negotiate your own terms, your own pricing, your own LTV and leverage. Yeah. If you want, if the focus is to get maximum leverage, let's say you want to get hundred mm -hmm. percent financing, what's your best way to position that? 
As a busy real estate investor or entrepreneur, time is money and first impression is everything. Every day to make it easy on myself, I wear Built Basics clothing. Whether you're a girl or guy looking for workout gear, joggers, shirts, button downs, hats, or shoes, Built's got you covered. Super comfortable, tight in all the right places to make you look fresh and clean all the time. Visit BuiltBasics.com and use promo code SUMMERS20 to receive 20% off of your order. Again, that's BuiltBasics.com. That's B-Y-L-T Basics.com. Use promo code SUMMERS20 to receive 20% off of your order. Now back to the show. Um, I tell the seller, I said, it's like a, a teeter-totter. If you have one side up, which is your purchase price, the other side's got to be down. Okay, You can't ask for a high purchase price and a high interest rate. You need to ask for a high purchase price, which is typically what they're obsessed with. So I go, you want a high purchase price? Perfect. Name your number. I'll come up to that number because that's what they're fixated on. I go, perfect. Let's do it. If we're going to do that number, I need to do a principal only payment. I don't say 0% interest because it's uh, it's like, wait, 0%? I just go, I'll pay you principal only. So it just pays down every single mm. month. And um, the teeter-totter thing really gets them like, okay, great. Well, what if I want 3%? I go, well, now what you're going to do is you're going to snap this board it, where this no longer becomes a teeter-totter. You got a high purchase price. I need a low payment. If you want now a high interest rate, well, then I got to give, give you a much lower uh uh, and he goes, a seller, a lot of times the seller will say, well, why would I do 0% seller finance? And I go, because we are guaranteeing your purchase price. Think about this. If you're a seller selling to me at $300,000, 5% interest, and you're thinking your 5% interest is going to be your cash flow over a long time, because effectively, th this is now getting into the weeds. Effectively, for the first 10 years, the seller's not receiving 5% interest. They're receiving more like 15, 17% interest because all of that interest is crowded all in the first 10 years of the amortization schedule, sure. right? So they're getting way more than 5%. So I go, look, if you're thinking we're going to go that route, but you want to charge me interest and a high purchase price, here's what's going to happen. In two years, I'm going to refinance you out and you're going to lose out all, all that interest because now you've motivated me to, to, mm. to, to refinance you out. Mm. But what if I just give you a locked in number? So instead of 300, I give you 350 and I guarantee you an extra 50. I don't refinance them, of course, but this is how I get them to do, okay, a higher, little higher purchase price, but they'll do principal only. And then I get zero down, zero percent interest. I don't know, probably 40% of the time. I love that you, you frame it as this is principal only, yeah. not zero yeah. percent. Uh, psychologically, it makes a lot more sense. Um, with those sellers, um, that, you know, let's say, let's say you're willing to overpay on the property. How do you determine exactly how much you're willing to overpay on that property? I always remind myself what Eileen Brown told me. She said, the value of something is not what you pay for it. The value is what it can do. And I was like, what do you mean by that? She says, if your payment, she actually told me this really interesting thing. She said, would you jump out of a plane for a hundred thousand dollars with no parachute? Immediate answer is no, of course not. That's stupid. Why would I do that? Okay, Pace, would you buy a million dollar, would you pay a million dollars for a house that's worth $100,000 ever? I'm like, no, immediately no. That's so stupid. She goes, okay, great. What if I told you that the airplane was still on the ground and it was a little two-seater airplane? Would you now jump out of the plane? I go, yeah. They never left the ground. You didn't tell me it was in the air. She goes, yeah. So a little bit more information changes mm -hmm. the context. Right. So she goes, Million dollar, million dollar payment. I'm sorry, million dollar purchase price on a hundred thousand dollar house. What if the seller says, just make me one dollar payment for a million months? Would you now buy that hundred thousand dollar house? I go, yes, because I know I can go rent it for a thousand bucks. Yeah, I'm netting nine hundred ninety nine dollars. What do I give a shit what I paid for the property? Right now, that's a very gross example. Mm -hmm. It's like nobody would want to do that. Right, but it just highlights to you that it's okay to pay a hundred percent of value for a property as long as your cash flow is there. Right, like. Think about this. If you bought an, uh, an air, uh, a boutique hotel for $7.5 million, but the seller seller financed everything to you and the hotel was only worth $6 million, you did zero down payment and no print and no interest. Would you b b buy that? Uh, zero, zero down payment and no interest. Yeah. Why? Because you because have, I'm gonna no, have no partners. You don't yeah. have to raise any capital. And even though you paid $1.5 million over the price of the property, it's going, the property is going to cash flow. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you will pay way less money on that 7.5 purchase price than somebody would at $6 million with 4% interest. 100%. So when you compare the amortization schedules to the two things, it's like, who's really paying more money? The person paying more money is the one that paid less money with interest. I'm paying higher dollar amount with no interest. I'm, I'm probably paying half as much money as that other idiot will. 
And so when you understand amortization, I'm willing to pay a little bit more money as long as the property is ca cash flowing heavy. And then in addition to that, we got inflation over time, you know, rents are going to go up over time. We know assets are yep. going to appreciate over time. And so if you're thinking long term, yep. 10, 15, 20 years, and if you don't have other investors, you're not forced to sell the asset on a specific hold period. You could just hold it forever. Yeah. Now I, I'm giving you these examples. So people listen to this, go, oh, pays over pays for his property. I don't have one property I paid 100 percent of value for ever. I have properties I paid 98% for, 99%, mm. 91%. Of market value. Of market value. Okay. And, um, but these are just examples to get people to think about them, right? Here's the great thing. Everybody else that's doing the birth strategy is going in and going, in order for me to get into the deal, get a loan, refinance it, get on a second loan, and get my money back, I've got to buy this deal at like 62 cents on the dollar in order for me to have that extra lift and be able to suck my money out on a, on a refinance. I don't have to refinance. So I can go to the seller and go, oh, those idiots are offering you 62 cents on the dollar. How, what would it take for us to do a zero down, 0% 0 seller finance deal? They go, pay me 90% of what it's worth and I'll give you that. I'm like, all right, great. I'll pay 23% more than the next person will on paper because I understand amortization and interest. And these other people are addicted to these archaic, barbaric, caveman bullshit styles mm. of like, let me go give you seven, per let me go to the bank and ask for them to give me money. Yeah. What are you doing asking the bank for the money? Here's what you're doing. You're asking the bank to give you a loan so that you can go pay off somebody else's loan. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. The only people that are now, you know, look, we'll do we do deals where I'll go refinance loans out when, you know, they've appreciated and the property's paid down. Last time we did a big refinance was in 2021. We pay, we refinanced, you know, like 50 of our properties that had a ton of equity. We stripped that money out and we get a lower interest rate. So of course I do use banks, but on the front end to acquire property, why would I go ask a bank's permission so I could go pay off another bank loan? Yeah. How about I just go to the seller and say, let me take this over, let's structure this paperwork wise. And the funny thing is there's more of these deals out there than in my mind, there are traditional deals. I think that traditional deals are the ones that actually need the real negotiations. I'm like, I look at all the properties on the market, I'm like, these are not deals. I have to go and negotiate these things way, way down on a cash offer. Otherwise, the bank doesn't make sense. So I can go in as a gangster. I don't not, Nick, Rich, I'm not even a great negotiator. You're a gangster, though. Why do I have you got to your be, CPA on these calls, yes. man? You got you got this down. The yes. systems and processes. And I think out. because you've negotiated so many times, I mean, yeah. I can I can feel it right now just talking to you is you just spit this out like it's yeah. it's just it's, it's just like a second language. A mu it's muscle memory for sure. Yeah, I love that. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming on, providing value. How can folks learn about the subject too? How can they get in touch with you? I know you got a big mastermind and that sort of thing. A huge community. Our, shout out to the sub two community. How yeah, can folks get in out. touch with you? Lo love them. Um, my YouTube channel is great. We've got 3,000 videos on there. And if you guys want to learn creative finance, our channel is 290,000 subscribers, I think. is Gangster. That's yeah, pretty good. Gangster. Pretty good for a, for a creative finance channel. Yeah. The closest creative finance channel to us has like 5,000 subscribers. <sighs> we're the only people in the game. So you're you're, run, you're running over the competition, my man. Yeah, we destroyed them. Yeah, I we, love it. We base, What we did is we taught them. So if the, you see competition that comes in, I hope you do, because that means that we probably taught them. Which is good. I want the, I want competition. It's healthy to have competition. But right, as of right now, there is nobody competing. I love it. Go check out my man Pace Instagram at Pace Morby. I appreciate you, bro. you, brother. Appreciate you. He's Pace Morby. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Later.